Hi guys, welcome back to Casa. it's Andrea here and today we're in Amsterdam to talk about Jasper's private watch collection. Let's wait for him and we'll see something, maybe more or less. Yeah. Andiamo, ragazzi. Let's go. Let's go. We're here in your lounge, finally. Welcome. Thank you. With the, with the box. It's, it's, it looks like the Biro, more or less. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I grabbed a quick box from uh, full of uh, candies. Yeah, I want to see. I, I really like had a hard time not opening it. So, I mean, let's cut off and open it. I'm super curious. Can I? Please, Thank be you. my guest. So uh, many watches are not necessarily on this occasion for my private collection. Sure. These are just the one that I had up for grabs. So it's just eight pieces from my personal collection. Awesome. It's one of the first times we see your personal collection. That is true. I didn't showcase it yet. Aye. As I said, it, this is not the entire collection, yeah, sure. but it is a, a pretty nice, interesting bit of watches. Hi. Okay. I'm super interested. There's a lot. I mean. It's eight watches, but from like every perspective All of over watch making, man. Yeah. Let's start with the most, like the simple, the most simple one. Mm -hmm. We, it is? For sure. It it's is. a regular 1601 folded Jubilee bracelet, which I love to wear because it's very light. It's very uh, comfortable. And it has the white gold bezel, you know, the fluted one. It's, it's a classic uh, piece of Rolex. And this was the watch when I, was 16, I saved up a lot back in the days yeah. and I purchased this watch. And how many times does it happen that you wear it and somebody asks you, oh, how much is it? No, seriously, <laughs> many people always buy it, but it has no price tag. Yeah, okay, sure. Okay, uh, 1601 is around 5,000, 6,000, no, 4,000 euro, one. whatever. If somebody would pay me 400,000 euro, I will never sell it. It's my watch. Mm. And when I wear this watch, even I wear watches that are a million euros, uh, 10,000 euro, 5,000 euro, uh, Rolex, Cartier, Patek, Audemars yep, Piquet. Sure. When I wear this watch, I have a real sense of pride. Uh, it's my first watch, you know, and there are very few watches that give me the joy that this 1601 gives me. So you started the journey when you were 16? Well, I started the journey like already exploring a bit when I was 14, I was okay. saving up and I chose this watch when I was 16 because then I had saved up enough because I thought it would match my lifestyle, which was too rough to buy like <laughs> a, a classic uh, manual bound uh, Patek or whatever, you know, and it is a watch that would fit any outfit. Yeah, that's for sure. And uh, have you been a huge fan of watches like nowadays or just uh, an enthusiast that wanted a good watch but nothing special? Like, You know, I, I love watches since I was a kid and I fill every day with watches. Yeah. Um, so it's a little bit of a disease and this is the result of that, that, that disease. Uh, but many watches in the end I keep for my private collection but at a certain point I sell them or whatsoever you know I trade them maybe against a finer example or a more rare example but this watch will never leave the collection <laughs> it's the only one in here that will never leave the collection it, it is not the only one another one that will not leave the collection is also a day date this is a 6305 um, check out the dial man it's beautiful isn't it it is it has a very nice tropical hue on it uh, because the positive. lacquer uh, gets a chemical reaction to like outside agents, moist or UV light, turns it into a beautiful brownish color. It has still has the radium plots on it. Uh, the nicer shaped hands, in my opinion, better yes. than baton hands. Uh, and this is a watch that was taken from me on gunpoint back when I was in Argentina. And I got it back. So no, this one was taken from my home. Sorry, another watch okay. was taken <laughs> at gunpoint. This one was robbed from my home when I had that, this watch a couple years ago and then I got it back in the end. So I, it will never leave my collection now because I fought hard to get it back. Yeah, sure. I mean, you have good stories behind your watches and that's, that's what's worth in the end. In the end, is that's, that's the true value over the price tag, you know, the emotion you have for the watch. And it's the true collecting. So Rolex was the first brand that got you? Uh, yeah, and still it's the number one brand for me. In the end, I love many pieces all different brands but nine out of ten days when I wish to pick up a watch to wear I choose for Rolex I still think it's the most user-friendly watch it's the most adaptable watch 
uh, it's the best brand in the world not only about watches but the best brand in the world period. yeah 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 they're amazing in many 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 aspects for real and I'm, I'm I'm sure about it, but uh, it's a little bit stereotyped to, uh, to 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 do to do so. But I mean, well, there's a reason everybody knows Rolex, and there's a reason everybody loves Rolex. And any watch collector or uh, lover says that he doesn't like Rolex, doesn't like watches. You cannot say you don't like Disney, but you like cartoons. It's stupid. Yeah. You know, any watch brand wouldn't be the same if it wasn't for Rolex. And maybe it's not your taste, or maybe you prefer a different brand. That's fine. That's all good. But Rolex, in my opinion, is the most historically significant brand that ever existed in the world of watches. Yeah, and you're mainly talking about vintage, because if I think about nowadays Rolex, I think that they play their game and that's it. I mean, that's honest, how much making is Rolex. Most of the modern contemporary Rolex watches, I don't care so much about them. Many I find very unattractive. Still, it's a good product always. Yeah, it um, is. Especially if you see the numbers they produce. It's amazing they can have this high quality. Yet, it doesn't get me like a modern Submariner. I, I found it unattractive and it doesn't get me warm as I know how many were made. They lack charm, etc. So I don't care about that watch, especially shit like Batman or the modern Pepsi or Hulk when like older guys are saying, oh, I have a Hulk. Yeah, Dude, who cares? I mean, go play, man. That's yeah. that shit is. <laughs> <laughs> Going on with a little bit of Rolexes, I see other two interesting pieces uh, apart from uh, the in most interesting pieces in here, which is let, let's start with that one. Your portrait here with this piece and I think that, that w lo looking at you now laughing <laughs> is the piece that think I think that makes you the most proud yeah how was I mean we're talking about one of the if not the rarest Milgaus you sound there. like an auctioneer now <laughs> <laughs> and we're starting at 100k <laughs> do I hear 120 somebody said I should do this so yeah, well, I think maybe you can. I think it can. maybe we can but yeah Tell me something about it. I mean, I look at it, it's it's really a good watch. But check the dial. This is a tropical one. It's yeah, not the it one is. on the portrait. I have two. Oh. I have two 6541. Uh -huh. I bought the one on the portrait first. It's a 6541 that was sold by Philips in 2019. It's a crisp example. It's incredibly sharp. It retains all the, the beveled edges. It is a dial that lacks all patina, but it's like new, it, it's like it left the factory yesterday. It's a top example, and I purchased that watch in 2020. However, that watch was too good to wear because it's basically in the old stock. Yeah. So in the end, I never wore it, and I felt ashamed. I finally got my grill watch, but I wasn't really enjoying it on yeah. the wrist. So therefore, I bought this watch. Which is like, uh, it's pretty interesting to see the patina. It looks like a constellation, more or less, or, or kind yeah. of a craquelet, but it's not, it's, I guess. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a bit craquelet. Uh, the previous owner had the watch for, I bought it from the grandson of the previous owner. Okay who had the watch for six, seven years. He wore it for six, seven years. When I purchased it, the crown was missing because he lost the crown and moist came in and that aged okay. dial. Yeah. Afterwards, he never wore it anymore. So he wore the watch for seven years. It already has a very nice character in the dial, but the case is pretty sharp. I had it repolished, so it has been polished, but you know, in a proper way. In a proper way. I was by Mr. Bob Polichan, who yep. did it for me. Uh, so it's a beautiful watch and I, I wear this watch every, every week. How do you feel about patina in general? I mean, uh, I see a good patina on that one, uh, but uh, everyone is looking for new old stock stuff. Yeah. Do you like also watches with a lot? I mean, that one has it, but maybe that one has a special value for you, so mm -hmm. it's all right, but in general. Well, it depends also on the watch. You know, a Submariner or a GMT, a vintage tool watch, a Daytona, it can be scratched, it can be scruffed, it adds to the charm. But if we're taking a look at, for example, a day date with diamond factory set stuff, then I prefer to have it top condition yeah, or uh, uh, Royal Oaks or Nautilus, you know. When those are worn out, it really doesn't look as good. Um, but then again, patina on the dial when it's tropical, it's, it, it's unique. So therefore, I always enjoy it over a new old stock watch. And why is it your grail watch? Uh, because for me, it's the most elusive model in the in the Rolex lineup. There's so much to be found about Submariner, so much to be found about GMT, Daytona, whatever. Uh, but such a little attention went out to the Milgaus, and the, you can see that in the production numbers. Yep. I mean, we're talking about maybe 200 pieces that ever saw the light of day. How many are still in original condition? How many are still around in the first place, you know? So for me, it's one of the most 
hardest to get watches and I believe your grill watch should be a real goal to achieve that will get you, will need a lot of effort. And I put so much effort in the search of those watches uh, and it is so gratifying to finally have two. Um, but one I will probably let go because I'm not enjoying it too much. Yeah, I mean, if you never wear it, it's... So uh, that one going to be for still in the end. And what's the next one? You grail one. talking. No, no, grail oh, talking. talking. Um, I might like a vintage perpetual calendar from Patek Philippe. Okay. Well, I like the 24.99 or 50.18. Yep. Uh, but unfortunately, still. I'm a poor guy. I don't <laughs> have that much of money. So uh, instead, I opted for a 39.70, which is like the modern iteration of the perpetual but calendar still, line. But still, you know? You know, it, it still has that perfect sizing, the 36 millimeter, it's spot on. Uh, it has the faceted case, the dial is beautiful with the recessed sub-dials. It has a crystal case back, you can see the movement. It has a great Bausch, nice finishing. I think this is the epitome of Patek Philippe complicated watch yep. in a classic uh, form. It really is. And how do you feel about, I, I mean, I'm not a huge fan of crystal case backs. How do you feel? Like, do you sometimes wind it and look at it or is it just something that you Well, the aesthetics for me about? at first are more important than the mechanism. Okay. I'm more of a guy that fall, falls in love with the story and with the looks of the watch. I do obviously enjoy good movement and nice finishing, so it's fun, fun once in a while to uh, take a glance at the movement, yet it's not one of the things that I buy a watch for. I don't buy a watch for the movement, I buy a watch for the history and the way it makes me feel. Um, so the crystal case bag, it's a nice plus, but it's not an, a necessity. Yeah. If I would love like complicated movements or high finish movements, I wouldn't be such a great Rolex fan. Um, so sure, sure, sure. And here we come with two questions that really tickles me. I mean, uh, at first when I was looking at Cartier's around, mm -hmm. uh, there were few dealers dealing them in a proper way and uh, giving them the the right attention uh, that they deserved. And you were one of the fir like you with the, the whole company were mm -hmm. one of the, of the first to do this. Yeah. How about the brand? I mean, are you a, a, a huge fan of it? Or well, I see you're wearing a Cartier, so it's yeah. good. Also, <laughs> the young people are enjoying these classic watches. But uh, it took now me it's some a time. It's a trend, but it also took me some time to uh, really understand why this watch holds its value like it does and why the romance behind the brand is so strong because it's about shapes, it's about, it it's about the gifts, it's about the experience, you know, and that's Cartier. And I hated Cartier first because I thought, okay, the movements are shit, sometimes even quartz. But then I started looking at it in a different way and I'm ashamed that I didn't put a Cartier in my lineup because I do own, own many nice Cartiers. Uh, but I started to enjoy it and we start to spread that yes. news and now there are many people, like young people like you, uh, Andrea, that also are enjoying Cartier's. I am a lot. I have a screenshot of a story of yours from like a year and a half ago uh, when someone asked you, is Cartier going to be the next big thing? And you said, I do believe so. And actually it, it went like that. And also with yellow gold. We're market makers, not market followers, <laughs> my friend. That's for sure. That's for sure. And also for yellow gold. I see yeah. a lot of yellow, I mean, a lot of yellow, three... I yeah, I love yeah. yellow gold. Three, no, that's... That's pink. That's pink, yeah, but yeah. like it's uh, two out of, uh, out of eight and one on your wrist, so... I love yellow gold. I always love to, to match the materials with my uh, accessories. So when I wear, I need to fucking wear glasses because otherwise I'm kind of blind. So when I wear <laughs> gold glasses, I wear a gold watch, I maybe wear a gold belt buckle or gold cufflinks, for example, Man. and steel or white gold the other way around works as well, you know, then I wear everything in that tone. So I think it's important to have a good variety. I do own like two pink gold ones here. Mm -hmm. uh, the only problem with pink gold is it doesn't work that great on my skin, but I do love them also because of the rarity of the material. But used. It, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, and may look in some iterations like yellow gold. So, true, true. lovely, but yeah. Talking about rose gold in here, uh, a piece I saw, uh, like, it's not that often that you see uh, that one, which is the star wheel from Audemars Piguet. What do you think about it? Tell me. Um, I was in Milan looking at uh, old clocks. You know the mm -hmm. old clocks for nighttime that they had the lights 
uh, and the system used to indicate the, the time was exactly the same. I know. And I went crazy to find one piece to shoot a video for that special, like for the museum, to pair with the watches. So how can I feel about it? I mean, I... Because you went to the AP museum, right? I went there. I think this belongs in a big cast there, like, to display the, the star wheel, because it's a pretty unique complication that they used. I strongly feel like they will make one again sooner or later because well, they really should they can hit me up because i can <laughs> contribute greatly i have five star wheels uh this for one kept yeah. for yourself yeah i have five now i will sell a couple of them dude i have two of this this is the um, engraved star wheel yes so you have mostly you have engraved or guillotine the engraved yep. are slightly more expensive and rare it's hand engraved and then you have white gold yellow gold and pink gold pink gold is rare white gold is even rarer but they're also stone dial examples with uh, the star wheel. They made a tiger eye one. That's Love pretty it. crazy, no. Okay. So I still need to get that, and then when I have them all, maybe I will sell some. Man. And I think that it really gets, uh, like, gives you a kind of an independent slash uh, new way of doing things, yeah. feeling. And about it, uh, seeing that one, I don't see you as a strong fan of independent brands. Or am I wrong? Well, as I, as I mentioned earlier on, the reason I love watches hasn't got so much to do with movements or stuff like that, you mm -hmm. know? So I do enjoy a fair share of independence and I think they're performing great and it's beautiful to see them. But I rarely would ever wear or buy a watch like that for myself because it has nothing to do with the reason why I love watches. I mean, for example, FP Journa makes incredible pieces. I've, I've glanced at many during the auctions. I have many clients who like them and I understand it for sure if people want to buy that. Uh, however, a boring day just like this, for me, has so much more to tell. Yeah. And therefore, it, it has my preference. But a watch like this is, like you said, it's a little bit in between. It almost yes. is some independent kind of style pretty unique it does a lot and uh, it's the first time i actually see one in person outside from the auction there that they had one at christie's yeah white, white gold, gold. Yeah. blue dial if yes. you know well yep and uh and i had no possibility to see that one because i was burned out and got off at the auction yeah <laughs> and it's the first time i see this in person in the metal and it's uh, really something that i mean it may be my well, it's it's not fair to say favorite piece in the collection because, but I'm on the eight as the one I would take for me if I had to. Yeah, so well, for what sure. I try to do in this collection that I that I got out now is to display quite some differences. Yes, you know I don't want to show you only uh, tool watches or I don't yeah, want to show you only only, yes. only day dates. You know, uh, talking about day dates, I do want to show you yeah. this one. First of all, I love the Jubilee bracelet. And to have it in pink gold is exceptionally rare, uh, in this condition even more so. And the dial is a grey dial, but most notably has baguette markers for the hours. So it's a pretty cool, pretty cool indices. Um, and a configuration like this, it, you know, it won't cost you the world. You can probably find one around 60k. Okay. But you have a pretty. I'm pretty sure you will have a piece that you will never find some somewhere else. So you have basically a unique Rolex for 60,000 euros. Sounds like a good deal to me, especially made in a precious metal with the stones, you know, diamonds are forever. I'm a gemologist myself. Uh, that's what I studied. Yes, here. So uh, therefore I like some, uh, only if it's factory, I like some yeah, gems. Man. Oh. Only factory. Only factory, for sure. No, I love this piece. I, I really like this piece because the, the contrast between the dial and, uh, and uh, the, the whole case and bracelet is a lot. True. And uh, it's a piece that stands out and uh, even though it's in uh, precious metal, I don't think that it's a piece that goes that much noticed True. when you wear it. Especially like baguettes, they don't shine as much as brilliant cut diamonds. So well, even a baguette better, are right? yeah, well, in rarity for sure. So even in, in the way it looks, it's, it's way more toned down. Whilst yep. we're talking about a gold Rolex, diamond set Rolex, you know, this is a really stylish piece. It is. And about it, uh, are you more for rarity or conditions? You know, it's always the same stuff. But yeah, you know, you're, it's, a, it's a great question to ask because you find, have to find the right balance. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's, I, it I, need to, I need to fall in love with the watch. 
uh, but rarity does play an important part not because I only want to buy a watch that's rare because it will go up in value or that kind of shit but it's your mind playing tricks on you you want a watch that nobody can get that's also the fun of collecting therefore I want this, this watch because a regular 1803 whatever how good the watch is mm -hmm. so many people can get it so it doesn't feel as much as a trophy as a watch as this oh, great so you don't buy it to get money in the future I, you know, in the end, I'm a dealer, so I buy many watches to, to trade. But there are also many watches I don't buy with my wallet, I buy with my heart. And this is one of them, I probably even overpaid for it. Uh, I don't care, because in the future it's going to be worth even more. So it's yeah. not the reason for me to buy a watch like this. This is the reason because I really believe the price I paid for it, which is 50,000 or 55,000 euro, is very justified. Great. When, when did you get it, by the way? This is one of my most uh, recent acquisitions. I got it, I think, two months ago. And I'm super curious, where do you buy them? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, some of them come from first owners uh, or their But here? Heads. Yeah. Okay, Maybe mostly. Local, you know, people know us from Instagram, so yeah, sure. Yeah, people offer us uh, watches even if we are sitting on our desktop. You know, people just offer watches. But some of them I find with dealers, some of them I buy from friends, uh, collectors, stuff like that. Um, and that's also sometimes the reason why I love to have a watch. For example, this watch, if yeah, you allow me. Yeah, yeah, this I watch I bought when I was super drunk. Um, and I Looks bought it like it. And it, then it has some <laughs> extra special feeling because I bought it from a good friend of mine uh, when we were drinking a lot of grappas in the restaurant. I guess it's Italian, so. And uh, you know, I saw the glass on this watch. It is, yeah, and it's but, but I saw the, uh, I was drunk and I saw the glass and I said, dude, your glass I'm of drunk. the watch is, no, the, the, the glass of the watch is broken, I thought, because it is cut internally, yep. so it reflects the light different. So he's, he's laughing and then he showed me the watch and I said, wow, dude, I need to have this watch. Yeah, it is, yeah. And actually, it's, uh, it's bad to say this on video, but it is, in my opinion, the next big thing, because everybody will ask Genta except for his production, and yeah. that's super stupid. Yeah. But you can see they're getting more love and, and more, you know, with the Topolinos and the Retrogradas yeah. and Bugatti reintroducing many pieces. But I think the success line, which is this watch, is a very interesting piece, especially when it comes on the integrated bracelet, which is quite rare. It has one of the very first carbon dials ever made, and the pushers and the crown work perfectly. It's so beautiful, the system, with like it, it sucks the air out. It goes vacuum, oh, okay. so it's, it's waterproof even. It's a very cool success model that doesn't house a quartz movement because yep. when you do, this one is with the automatic caliber. Okay. That is not very interesting, but it's regardless, the design is very cool. Love it. How is your feeling with Genta? I mean, you, you sold a lot of Genta watches yeah. uh, in general, but uh, I think there, there, there is a lot of production still to be known and appreciated. Yeah. Apart from even his models, but uh, do you agree with the fact that he is the most important designer or? At this point of time, um, he is definitely the most appreciated designer. Yep. And he definitely put out uh, his stamp on the watch world. Even if you take a look at, at the designs from nowadays, many are inspired by, by his likes. Uh, so that's interesting to note. Um, you know, that's the, that's the thing with a watch lover. If you say Gerald Genda, everybody knows who we're talking about. Yep. Everybody sees their shapes. And it, even many people talk about a watch saying, you know, you know this kind of Gerald Genta like. So his, his style is so well known and so strong that people even associate different stuff with him. I think that's, a, that's beautiful. Yeah, yeah, I made a great, great job with it. What's special about this one? Take a look. Because, uh, yeah, I've seen... You might seen think it's normal. Yeah, yeah, no, but a uh, couple details are really not normal, like... It's very not normal, I can tell you. Look take a look. Looking for, like, if it was on someone's wrist at a bar, I would say, okay, it's a simple Daytona, you know? Nothing special, There's but, a reason uh, it's in my case, because if it was a regular Daytona, it wouldn't <laughs> be in here. Apart from this day, just nothing really regular. I mean, that, that one is regular, but special you can see it more itself. Often. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, that, that one reminds me of a good story you told me that we will never tell people, you know, uh, but it's better not to. And, uh, but really reminds me of that watch. But it's not that watch, right? What you're holding here is the, a watch called the Moonraker. Okay. Uh, the Moonraker is a prototipo, as the Italians <laughs> like to say it. This sounds more like Sergio. <laughs> <man>. <laughs> 
So it's a pretty cool watch. It's basically um, the 16520 dial designs incorporated into 116520. Mm -hmm. So they went from caliber 4030 Zenit based El Primero movement to 4130 in uh, 2000. Uh, but in the meantime, obviously, they had to make their own movement. The Caliber 4130 was their own chronograph movement, the first in-house shit. Uh, but to accomplish that, they were trying already for five or six years. This watch, the dial actually is from 1996. But as you can see from the positioning of the sub-dials and the use of tritium, uh, you can see it's from 1996, but the positioning of the sub-dials indicated it was made for Caliber 4130. So this is one of the first dial designs they ever made for uh, their first in-house movement. So it still has the small markers like on the Zenit Daytona. It still has the grenade finish on the dial mm -hmm. like on the Zenit Daytona. It still has the tritium like on the Zenit Daytona. And it has racing hands, which is a pretty cool detail. Yep. But it is in a 116520. So it has all the dial designs from the previous model, but incorporated into the new model. Uh, only two are known. One is uh, in the book with Pucci Papaleo, who shot it, who called it the Moonraker. Therefore, I'm saying the Moonraker. And uh, I'm pretty lucky to have this watch. Yeah, I, I really think so. Never seen it in the metal before. Never yeah. even know it existed, actually. I mean. Yeah, that's the thing. There's only one uh, other known example. There's a picture of that watch. So if you dig really deep, you can find it. Uh, or if you buy the book from Pucci. <laughs> um, but this is the second known example, and uh, we don't know how many there are, they're not numbered or anything. Regardless, it's a pretty uh, amazing find. Has everyone ever spotted it on you? No, I don't wear this watch. Okay, yeah, uh, I, I can see that it's n Not because really of the condition, I don't like the No, looks. but I think also the bracelet is really big. Yeah, the bracelet is super big. Yeah, yeah the bracelet is super big. It's uh, they never <laughs> took out a link. I've never worn this watch. I don't love the watch because I don't like the... Uh, it's too big for me. Uh, so I wouldn't wear it. Okay. I bought that. We were talking about rarity, and sometimes, you know, your mind yeah. playing tricks on you. I wanted this watch because nobody else can get it, but not because I like it. Because I don't. Uh, it's a good watch, and on many people it will look good. But it's not my style. It's too big. You know, it's too sporty. So it's a it's a great watch uh, to have in the collection and to uh, fuck over your friends with, saying, "Ah, you cannot get this watch. <laughs> I have this watch. You're a shitty collector. I'm a cool collector." But in the end, it's not the watch that I will wear. Man, I love that philosophy. But how do you feel about, like, it's a big one with all this, but this is a big one as well. And, uh, yeah. and you're wearing it. Yeah, this one, I'm wearing it because I bought it yesterday and I just was wearing it. I don't know. No, uh, no. It's not my watch. I will sell it as easily. Um, but I, my sweet spot is uh, 34 to 36, oh, sometimes okay. 37 millimeters. Mm. And I prefer too small over too big. I believe a watch that's too big is super ugly, uh, but a watch that's too small can really be a statement piece. So a lot of questions I had are uh, not, re not, not relatable, because what do you think about Richard Mille? It's too big. <laughs> it's too big. <laughs> on the first place. And it's then, too big uh, and uh, they did a great job on the marketing and the product yep. itself. Was, it's so much. It's, it's good. It's a good watch. Uh, once but again, still. Uh, it's hella ugly, so you will never see me wearing one. No, no. And about like Piaget and small Cartiers and all stuff, are That's these cool. too small for you? Or no, not at all. I like a small Cartier, especially Cartier. Like if you have a small Cartier on the wrist, it's so strong in the yeah, looks. So it has a beautiful piece. presence on the it wrist, is. even if it's small. It is. Thanks, man. Apart, apart from your collection, what is uh, one advice you would give? No, first, where is your knowledge from? Like where do you study, basically? Like I study here. Okay. What we're doing now is studying. Okay. You're telling me what you think about a watch. I'm telling you what I think about a watch. I'm telling you how I got a watch and why this watch has this configuration. You're telling me about a watch. That's how I learn from other people. You know, I go to these auction weekends to meet collectors, for dealers. This. We're yes, talking about that every day. You know, I'm on the internet forums, on, on, in books, etc. You can learn a lot. But in the end, if you hold the watch in your hand, you wear the watch, you will learn so much more about the watch, you will learn so much more about yourself. And if you share that knowledge, it will go on and go on. And in the end, you know, you get a, no a lot of knowledge. That's super true. It's my same philosophy. And about it, what is the advice you would give to someone my age? Yeah. Who's starting collecting? Big, big advice. Don't think a watch is an investment. It can be an investment. You buy it as an investment for your fun. You don't buy it for financial gains. If that's your... Is that if that's your prime motivation, you shouldn't be collecting and you should trade stocks. 
Um, surely many of these watches go up in value, uh, but you're a dick if that's the reason why you're buying it, because you should leave those nice watches to the people that will actually enjoy them and love them, like me or like uh, like uh, Mr. I am Casa, uh, but preferably me. Um, <laughs> you have more budget for sure. So. Uh, I, I'm not <laughs> sure about that, Andrea, but that's the thing, you know. Uh, I think that's the wrong reason for purchasing a watch. You have to buy the watch because you love the watch. Uh, the same reason why you w should find a partner that will make you better and that will uh, you would you like to uh, enjoy the rest of your life with, not to find a partner because he or she makes a lot of money and you want to be with a person that makes more money or whatever. And that's that's much from a watch dealer, man. Oh uh, well, yeah, I guess <laughs> so. I guess so. Thank you so much for being here and show me your personal collection. My pleasure. It was great to be in Amsterdam with you guys. Time Thanks for Jasper. a grandpa. Yes, it is. Thank you, boys. Thanks, man. <laughs> great Cheers. Pleasure. Cheers. <laughs>